Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Sharonda Williams for Pay or Wait. And I have to say that Sherman's Showcase Season 2 could not have come like at a better time when we just need a moment to smile, to laugh. And um, I really wanted to ask you, like, did you guys know that you were going to be prophesizing with uh, Drop Some Kente? You know, because when I watched it, I was like, this hits totally different given everything that's been happening, you know, in the world. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we did prophesy that. This is just one of those times where, you know, for me, it definitely affirms my belief in a higher power. Uh, it, the universe caught up with us and made us relevant. You know, uh, Kente calls for me was just something I grew up with. My mom had and all over the house. My sister, uh, like a lot of black college and, and high school graduates and grad school graduates, wore it as a Kente cloth stole when she walked across the stage. And we just, you know, we would always go to African cultural festivals, et cetera. So it just was always, always present. And then so we were doing our special, which originally, this is the bigger part of it. Originally, the special was supposed to be in February. But then at the, at the last minute, the network was like, you know, we think we're going to push to June. We feel like better about a June launch. We were like, well, you know, but it's called the Black History Month. It's called the Black History Month special. I don't know if June makes sense. It's a black history. And they were like, uh, we're going to do it in June. We're like, great, let's do it in June. So we did it. We moved to June. Luckily for us, it happened on a June 10th, which should be a national holiday. But everything and a lot of the things we talked about it, and we're just, you know, coming from our experiences as two black guys. And like, again, with even with Edson Kente, you know, that was just us thinking about like ways in which people could, you know, be allied, you know, during Black History Month. And so we wrote this really fun song. And we had all, I'm from Chicago, so we had already wanted to do a house song. And so we got with this really great, great remixer named uh, DJ Viceroy, who put together an incredible track. My sister Zuri, who sings on it, came up with the melody for it, and she was singing it. And then the writer room got together and wrote the words. And it's sort of like, when well, you create comedy, often it's like that. It's piecemeal. But the fact that all that stuff came together, and the fact that it's relevant now when it couldn't be more relevant, I mean, that's out of our hands. And we just appreciate it. Um, so also, too, <clears throat> since we're talking about the songs, and that's probably one of my favorite parts is just that we get all of these songs that, you know, they're a part of the skit, but they be hidden. Mm -hmm. they be <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, look, you know, I, 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 I'm a DJ, which means that at some point, I, every DJ thinks, I can do this better than this person whose song I'm playing. Um, I, I, we had a lot of contact through both my DJing and some previous projects we'd work on with all kinds of talent. Um, you know, whether that was John Legend or Drake. In the case of Sherman Showcase, we've worked the most with Fonte Coleman from uh, the group Little Brother and Foreign Exchange and his solo albums. And he came through and gave us great songs. But we also got songs from like The Knox. We got great songs from Sasha Spielberg, AKA Buzzy Lee. We wanted to bring in Neil. Like we always wanted our songs to be like Lonely Island songs, funny, but like also like fully capable of rocking a party. And you would also, so, you would, would also play the music when he was DJing. See, he DJs, yeah. you know, not just a lot, he does big parties, he does. Like when I DJed for episodes. the Kiss and Grind one time, I like mixed in Time Loop. And we hadn't even dropped that episode yet, but people kept dancing. So I was like, oh, they must like this song because no, literally none of these hundreds of people of dancing have ever heard the song before and yet they didn't all clear the dance floor. So that's when I knew that we were onto something. Uh, yeah, we put a lot of time into every aspect of the show, really. I mean, like, we spent a lot of time making sure the music is every bit as good as the music you hear on the radio, and that's how we were able to get signed to a, a record deal with Mad Decent. We make sure every line of dialogue you hear is as funny as we can possibly make it before we ever shoot it. Uh, we have a fantastic director named Matt Piedmont who makes sure every single shot looks like it was a million-dollar budget, even though it was probably, you know, 1% of a million dollars <laughs> to shoot that scene. I mean, like, we go out of our way to make sure every single thing that you get is 100% curated and just really special. I always felt like Sherman's was like, a, like if somebody handed you the ultimate handmade gift for your birthday. You know, it may not be the most expensive gift you get that year, but you'll get the sense that they put time and thought and energy into that gift. I mean, like, that's, that's the degree at which we work on this. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. So since we're talking about the music, you know I got to bring a drop it low for Jesus. <laughs> yes. Mm. Let's talk about it. Yes, because, you know, I come, you know, I thought about playing this for my mother because she is, like, super religious. I was, like, a religious church kid, 
can't play yeah. music, can't play secular <laughs> music if it's storming outside because the Lord doing his work. Um, but I'm still in trouble with her for smoking hookah, so we're going to let her <laughs> But I wanted to um, ask you, when you were coming up with this song, you know, did you, first, what was the concept? Like, how did you decide to, like, come up with the lyrics and stuff? Mm-hmm. And then also, too, did you know that it was going to get this much controversy behind it as well? Uh, you know, that song actually comes from a really um, personal place. My sister... My two sisters actually were the original or, or originators of it. My grandmother, uh, God rest her soul, Betty Tyler, was the most religious woman I ever met in my life. You know, she is one of these people. You go over to their house, it is the TV is only on one channel. It's the 700 Club. It's on that all day, and then all those uh, televangelists back to back. So that's all she watched all day long. But she also, and I'm not, I shouldn't say religious people don't have a sense of humor. Many, many do, and like many who do, my grandmother had an incredible sense of humor. So my sisters were messing around. They were like, "What's this, what song could we sing that would be so over the top that would just make her go crazy? And so they came up with <laughs> Drop It Low for Jesus. And my grandmother used to just howl laughing at that. She was like, oh, my God, y'all are so wrong. But she loved it. And I think that was such a blessing to put a smile on her face. And this actually was toward the end of her life. And so as Sherman Showcase was getting started, you know, writers often bring in, like, you know, Diallo was telling the writer, he was like, look, bring in stuff from your life that you find funny. Bring in stuff from your experience. Bring in stuff from your family's. Bring in jokes that you and your brother tell each other that nobody would get. Bring in jokes that you and your high school friends would tell that people wouldn't get. Bring in that personal stuff. So, you know, they brought it to him. He loved it. And then at that point, we got Fonte Coleman involved. Fonte is an incredible musician. He ended up giving us a gospel track that did sound correct. You know, there's nothing worse than hearing a bit of music, especially for a piece of comedy. And it's like, it's funny, but the music is just not, like, that's not, that is not up to snuff. Yeah. And he did the opposite. He created this incredible track it was beautiful and layered and textured. And more importantly, it was knowing. It knew what gospel music was supposed to sound like when it sounds right. And so all these different artistic people came together to make it. I was actually um, really happy when the thing went viral. But then also I had to be educated about, you know, the fact that the comment section was like a little bit of a war zone sometimes. I'm not really on social media. But Diallo was like, man, it's, it's, we didn't create it. They're coming at us. They're coming at us. But you know, <laughs> I told you. It was a fight. It was like both sides, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, most people loved it. And before we ever even put it out, you know, I wanted to personally bounce it off of somebody who I knew was religious. And I was like, right. like, like right. church going, I, I'm religious, but I, this person is very church going. And I, I reached out to Brisha Webb and I was like, hey, you know, we're doing this song called uh, Drop It Low for Jesus. And uh, I want you to hear it and tell me what you think. And she's like, I love it. I was like, oh, you love it? She's like, yeah, we could drop it low for all these other people out here. We could definitely drop it low for him. So I was like, there you go, Brisha. I love you so much. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, that's really- one of those things where we always, we always like to keep lots of black people around in our writer's room, yep, 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 on set, yep. the grip, the camera person. Because if they're laughing and smiling, then we feel by extension that's just our family members laughing and smiling. And that's... Mm-hmm. That's that's our comfort zone, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so, yeah. Oh, were you about to say something? I'm sorry. I was just going to say, like, right now there's this whole t- conversation about diversity in Hollywood and how to get more, more, you know, brothers and sisters, like, behind the camera and behind the, the scenes. And I, I would say that Bashir and I have done that. Um, we've done that not by accident, but by design. Not because it's the right, th- even because it's the right thing to do, it's because it makes our work better. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's what people forget is that, you know, by having more than, you know, just the traditional people in traditional roles, when you have diversity in new roles, it makes the work better. You know, it's not, I take issue with the people who think that, oh, you're not hiring on based on merit anymore. No, I think that we are. Um, and that's that's what I'd say about that. Um, so another segment um, that I enjoyed from the premiere was the kind of the Black Vampire Roundtable that we had. Is yes, that, I love um, that sketch. I love how, because especially because now it's so, it's the new fad to be Black. You know, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so let's find all these Black TV shows and films and put Black people, you know, expose everyone to what black people have already been doing for years on years and so mm. i wanted to ask about if you had to create a black superhero round table um because ever since black panther has come out it's almost as if everyone forgot that you know we've had other black superheroes <laughs> even that blade was on your round table as well for the vampires yeah. um so mm-hmm. who would you what black superheroes would you bring to 
the tape. I would bring, I would definitely bring, you know, Bishop. I was going to say know, Bishop is, Bishop is my uh, all new X-Men. He is so dope. Uh, Hollywood. Cyborg. Cyborg, <laughs> who has like kind of a questionable name. <laughs> yeah, Cyborg. <laughs> you know, I think Storm is a character who Storm's a know, classic. definitely could use a standalone movie, particularly if they I'm steep so it in. I mean, but it really needs to be steeped in the classic storm. I think nowadays, not to get too deep in the comic books lore, but because we obviously, you can tell by our work, we're big, you know, comic book nerds as well. But I do think yeah. nowadays, comic books, when the new ones come out, they're literally almost just storyboards for movies like the, the Marvel, not the biggest Marvel, but I feel like sometimes these companies are like using the comic book to see if the story works, right? And then you watch the movie and you go, oh man, this is almost like shot for shot from the comic book. Right. I think before that, the stories were so rich and intricate and, and unexpected and detailed. And I do think that the audience, you know, respond more to stuff that they haven't seen before. And a lot of what they haven't seen before already exists. They just have to get it in front of the camera. So I would love to see that character as well. But this is all, you know, we have a character around our show speaking of black superheroes. That this is like, this is like if your mama made you go to like every black event in your city kind of stuff. And like your parents are like, we're going to buy something black. We're going to make a black cabbage patch doll and this other stuff. So we have a character in our first season who does make an appearance in the spectacular named First Man. Mm -hmm. And First Man is our He-Man character, but people don't realize the reason we came up with that is because when He-Man came out, you know, where, you know, and I, by the way, I was a He-Man acolyte. I still watch He-Man, by the way, but you know, he's rocking the German cross on his chest. And <laughs> my, parents was like, my parents was like, oh, I don't know about that. So there was a black company that, I don't, let me not say it was a black company. I don't know it was a black company, but there was a company that put out something called Sun Man. You remember Sun Man? I haven't heard of Sun Man. Okay, so Google Sun it, Man, it's, fun. It's, on, it's, on, it's on Google, it's on the Google, but Sun Man looked physically like He-Man, but he was, it was a brother. It, it came off of the exact same toy line, so it was just He-Man with dark skin, but a different, a different, different hair. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents, and, my parents got that for us. They were like, y'all gonna play with Sun Man. And so for us, it, you know, that's why that character of, of First Man exists. He actually comes from, you know, from our past, from something that our parents were like pushing. And we were like, no, we want He-Man. What the hell? What is this? <laughs> See, now I gotta go look that up. Cause you know, when I was growing up, Google. I remember Meteor Man, like the movie Meteor Man. That was the Robert, was, the Robert, uh, Robert Townsend. Robert Townsend, right? yeah. yeah. That was, and then Blank Man, you know, as well, even though the fan, the fan. And yeah, I, I, I would even take it a step further and say that like I had a slew of Afrocentric toys. And I think that that's something Bashir and I have always responded to. If we, if we do another round table, uh, we might go back to an idea we had a long time ago, which was called uh, Black Issues in Space, which is all the black science fiction characters having a similar bit to Conversations of Vampires. Even hearing you talk about it, I kind of want to do something like the um, the black action figures roundtable. So like you could have all the black G.I. Joes and all the black... Roadblock and all, all the Transformers who had black voices, you know? Like, ja jazz. I mean, uh, yeah, jazz. exactly. Ja Why is his name Jazz, by the way? He's a cop car. Yeah, How exactly. weird is yeah, that? Yeah, How yeah, weird is that? Named jazz. A cop car named Jazz. I'm pretty sure uh, he was voiced by Scott Man Crothers. By the way, Bumblebee from the Transformer movies who, like, just started breakdancing out of nowhere, you know? Like, there's... There's all kinds of uh, there's all kinds of stuff that we would tackle. And as far as first man, I just want to say real quick that also comes from our love of like 1940s style serial movies, Absolutely. like those things that were you know. So if you go back and you look at like the Captain America of the 1940s or Flash Gordon, like it's amazing what they were able to accomplish on tiny little sets in Hollywood, and that yeah. kids around the world were like watching those things, like oh yeah, go get him, go get him, like. I, I, I can watch those things forever because they're in a weird way, like they're still fun to this day. Um, and so yeah, that was the chance for us to embrace our love of that medium. You know, just really quickly, it reminds me, Diallo, of, you know, before the internet, we first moved to LA, um, there's, a, there's a place out in Los Angeles called the, uh, the Museum of Television and Radio. And they have a bunch of old, old TV shows. You would go, it's like a library, basically. You go, you sit out, and then you can call up like a 19, you know, 58 episode of, uh, uh, you know, I Love Lucy or something like that, right? You can watch all this old, old stuff. And we love that stuff. We love digging into that old lore and, and seeing the stuff that we know we, and learning so much about the thing we had chosen to be in, which is, which is film and television. But the point I'm making is that our interests were really specific to us. And the thing that I think Sherman Showcase really tries to push out more than anything is that, you know, you can't put black people in the box. You know, you might see certain parts over and over again played by black people because of the lack of creativity of the producers on that side. 
But the truth of the matter is, you know, we were taking our TV show around. I would always talk to fans who were there, and I especially talked to the black fans, and I would say, what other TV shows are you watching? And every single person gave me a different answer. And then it just affirmed for me, like, yeah, like, Hollywood, stop trying to tell us what it is we want to watch. And more importantly, stop trying to tell us what it is that we get to make. And that's the thing I'm proudest about Sherman Showcase. Like, Sherman Showcase is like a toy box of stuff me and Diallo and our writers love. Some of that stuff you will love. Some of the stuff will be new to you and unfamiliar to you. You get to see that we love, we're kind of music nerds. You get to see that we're like comic book nerds. But we're still black, right? And we're still guys who have those interests. And other people have different interests. And I really think that if, as we go forward, we start to see, and I know Netflix does a really good job of this too, you start to see more stuff, you know, like See You Tomorrow, when you start to see more stuff that really pushes the boundaries of where black characters can perform. Not just putting black characters in roles traditionally, you know, reserved for white characters, but actually just having black creators, let them blow your mind. Let them give you something they thought of that they think nobody would get and put it out there. Because I think that's how we really push forward the entertainment industry is to say, you know, these young people, these young black folks are putting out stuff that we couldn't even have conceived of because they're finally being allowed to, to tell stories about the things they love. Uh, by the way, I, can I just say that's why I actually really like Pay or Wait because you review everything, you know? It doesn't have to be just the black movies. And exactly. I feel like those are the boxes that Hollywood tends to, like... I bet you the people who, who read your website have no idea. They've never clicked on about and they have no idea that you're black, which in some ways is, you know... I, I just think that it's important that we be allowed to just go towards where our interests are and not be, you know, pigeonholed. And not be dictated to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I really appreciate, you know, what you do also to with Sherman Showcase, but also to Southside, because, you know, it takes, it kind of revamps people's view on what they hear about Chicago, right? Um, cause my Absolutely. Brother lived there, you know, and the fact that we have joy, even though the world tries to depict us as one way, there's still Black yeah. joy that we experience, you know, and yeah. how we laugh and, you know, just even how you tackle, like, the history you know, yep. and still with Drake Ellington tying everything into <laughs> now. I mean, but that stuff, it, it matters, right? And that's why yeah. I do your weight because I do video too because I want them to see like, hey, I'm a black girl. I watch comic book movies and Game of Thrones. We watch all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Seriously. We, we, I, I'm not just saying that we make, we make the show for you and because yep. we feel like we have, there are a lot of kindred spirits, a lot of nerdy, wonderful, outsidery black people who, you know, don't always get to see something where a cartoon character destroys Plymouth Rock in the same hour that we're making Zora Neale Hurston jokes. And that's that's why we do what we do. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs>